My name's Larry Morris. I'm the administrative director for Nazarene Discipleship International. I work with Scott Rainey, um, and uh, been a privilege to work work with him the last. I think he's been in office about five years now, so it's been a blessing to to be with him. And uh, you probably, if you were in the plenary, you've heard a lot about what has happened to probably Sunday School Ministries International now, the NDI, and some of that has impact to what we're talking about today. This particular session is gonna be a fun one. Well, the other one is, of course, fun too, but this <laughs> one's gonna be especially fun um, in that this is a compilation of, of master teacher information that I've accumulated and heard about over the years. Part of it is just tied to patterns and teaching that make you or uh, put, put you in a place of being effective, most effective for your class. And so part of it is to go probably pretty quickly here. It's not a Saturday night special. Uh, I was asked about that. Are you going to teach the Saturday or Sunday morning special when you just, you know, you get the material one time and uh, you've got to, uh, got to put together a lesson in a matter of minutes? Um, no, this is designed to help you be as effective as you can, being honest to the scriptures as well as effective with your Sunday school class. And there's some patterns that we have found over the years that maximize that ability and your, and your ability to, to be effective. So that's what we'll share and then we'll share some of the wisdom that I've received from others over the years as far as Sunday school teaching. Let's see where we go here. Let's start off with prayer, and then we'll continue from there. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for, first of all, your love and your grace, for your safety bringing us here, for the opportunity of participating in this event, um, sensing your presence and uh, getting your guidance through the information we see, but most of all, getting your guidance on how to apply it to our lives and to those that we are responsible for. I pray that you'll be with me, uh, help me to communicate well and help through your Holy Spirit for what is important information for each person here to, to understand and to apply uh, that they would be receptive to that as well. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, first of all, we've all, how many of you had lunch? <laughs> what happens after lunch? You never have a Sunday school class after lunch. I think there was a reason, but even before before lunch, it's a difficulty. Uh, this is this is what usually happens to me after lunch time and after eating. Uh, you know, you pick pick your pose. Uh, we just got a cat uh, again, and uh, pretty much it's pretty close to what what the cat likes to do. And some of us uh, prefer this pose. <laughs> so if you really need to take a nap, just don't snore. That might bother the person next to you there and get a neighbor nudge. But other than that, uh, hopefully none of you will need the need or have the need to, to take a snooze while we're here. So this is what we'll cover in this session. First is daily patterns of effective Sunday school teachers. What are those patterns that set you up for success in communicating the gospel or the lesson plan? And the second, words of wisdom from master teachers. Uh, this not as a compilation of everything that's ever been taught by any master teacher. There's some that I'm sure that you've been involved with that uh, would add to this list, but some that, there are some of that wisdom that, it, that were, came to my mind. And feel free to share your thoughts as well. And then recommended resources. We're going to look at a few of the recommended resources that are out there for you to use as a Sunday school teacher and a small group leader. It doesn't mean that you can't use these in other formats as well because I find there's a great association between small group work and Sunday school leadership work. First we look at the daily habit patterns and this is so basic you're going to go I'm here for that, <laughs> I know that. The best time to start preparing for your next Sunday school lesson is Sunday, Sunday afternoon. Start early. I mean, regardless of what we're doing in our jobs and so forth, if you start early, that sets you up for success. It allows your mind to think about the scripture and the lesson and start to process that. And God 
sins to help minds that are attuned with his over a longer period of time. And so uh, we benefit ourselves. Uh, I think we benefit the kingdom and we also benefit those that God has put uh, in our hands when we start early and start to think about the lesson. And, uh, you know, sometimes God bless cramming. <laughs> he has with me on times on a Saturday night special. I was telling the last class that I got a call from the Sunday school teacher that came back and he was sick. And I got it at uh, 7, almost 8 o'clock on a Saturday. So I did do a Saturday special to teach that class. They had COVID, so I felt obligated. Otherwise, I would just told them to pray and get over it. But I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> and begin with prayer. Uh, pray is everything, you know, depends on you. And prepare is everything. I mean, pray is everything, depend, everything depends upon God and, pre and prepare as if everything depends upon you. Um, that's where it starts. So on Sunday, real quickly, it's great to review the next Sunday's lesson, become acquainted with the scripture, write down any major points, and look at, the, at what was the objective of the lesson, where is the lesson going, just to get it prepared, you know, prepare your mind. This shouldn't take you more than 10 or 15 minutes. If you're going beyond that time, you know, maybe overdoing it, not that you shouldn't, maybe you, you'd like to, but at least spend 10 or 15 minutes just looking at the basics within that lesson and get your mind in that direction. Then on Monday through Wednesday, read and study the scripture passage or passages. I strongly recommend that you look at the passage and the reference material and the context. Read the chapters before, or maybe at least the chapter before and the chapter after, to give you the right context of the passage. A lot of scriptures taken out of context, and it can lead you down wrong passage and pathways. So make sure that you're in context, that God can put it in context. That will help you. And then note any concepts or words that require explanation for you or your group. You don't understand them. Um, I know it's never happened to you, but there's been an occasion when I've done a Saturday night special. And uh, not that I would do that, but when I do and I come across in the lesson a word that I should have looked up and I didn't and I'm questioned about it. And I go, shucks, I wish, to, wish I would have focused on that. But looking at those passages ahead of time and looking at our reference materials just to make sure that I'm aware and prepared helps me in that study. And to do it early enough that when I'm looking, working on the lesson going forward, that um, there starts to be connections between these special words or these special references and where the lesson is going and how it applies to life. And then on Thursday and Friday, begin prayerfully outlining the session with the following progression in mind. One individual in the last class talked about the change in the uh, Foundry lesson program, especially in the adult, but it's true in the other uh, curriculum as well, children and youth, uh, that you know, sometimes they shift the words related to each section. And that, that happens from time to time. But I let you know, having worked in curriculum for a number of years, the progression is actually follows a four-step process consistently. And if you know those four steps, regardless of the curriculum and regardless of what they name that curriculum, uh, you will end up with a stronger lesson. You will understand the pattern. And it is, starts out with, I'll use the, the generic terms that are used for it. Hook, book, look, and took. And let's look at each one individually. Hook is the, con the con uh, connecting, connecting the, the welcome. <laughs> Hook is connecting the, the information to your audience, or they're getting, connecting with your audience to the subject at hand. And uh, we talked about it, uh, it used to be in the lesson they called it engage, engage your group, or en engage, I'm trying to think of what they have it, have it called in this particular curriculum. But that is gathering the information from every, everyone, getting, them, getting everybody to focus on the subject at hand. Your first major job is to gather people's attention to the subject. 
we used to do this in, in conferences, is we had everybody stand up and look in a different direction. And say, now turn and look where everybody else is looking, in which everybody else is looking in a different direction. Says, that's exactly how your class comes in. Because every person has something else on their mind. Very few of them are thinking, well, I'm excited about this Sunday school lesson and I want to ask this question. Some of them that are really studious do. But most of them are thinking, well, what am I going to have for lunch? Uh, I'm going to have to talk to my wife again or my husband about this. The kids were giving me a pain and I'm going to have to deal with this after, you know, after the, the Sunday. I'm going to figure out how I'm going to handle this situation or I just got a call from you know, the doctor before and how am I going to process that information. They are scattered. So during this first section, your opportunity and responsibility is to gather everybody's attention on one central subject, and that's the sub subject of your lesson, so the hook. Then the second one, as you see, is book, and that's connecting that, that subject matter, or the hook, to the scripture at hand within context of the passage. So whatever that passage is about, you move from the attention gathering section to here is the scripture that addresses that information or that, that issue. Then look, how does that scripture apply to modern day life? Because the culture is different, you address with the book, the scripture within, within the cultural contact, context, and then you move to how does that scripture correctly apply to the culture of today? And then took, which you could say take is probably more appropriately is took, what, are, what is the personal application that your class needs to move away? What action do they need to take as a result of that information? So hook from getting their attention to looking at the scripture in context to how does this apply today? And quite often there is a, you know, a, quite a conversation about how does this scripture in context apply to life today? And now, how does it personally apply to me? What do I do next? And that's a, an important prior to the process that quite often Sunday school's lessons don't deal with strongly enough or, or we don't give enough um, uh, application to or put application to in, in classes. So all four of those steps you will see used and they are important to carrying a lesson all the way from getting people's attention to taking action. So a good Sunday school lesson, even a good message follows this pattern. So any questions about that? You understand that it doesn't matter what the curriculum is or you can design your own that is a solid way to put together a solid lesson. Then on Thursday the Friday, insert any illustrations that make the lesson more relevant to your participants. Um, think about where they're sitting and what are the issues they might be dealing with. So, and there may be illustrations, both contemporary illustrations or illustrations from the past that come to mind that you need to tie to that lesson. And then consider the learning preferences of your group. Don't think everybody learns by me talking, <laughs> uh, or you talking, or uh, you know the same way. We we learn different ways. So as many ways as you can use uh, visuals, uh, illustrations, etc., do that. And think men learn differently than women typically. Uh, we have our preferences. So think about how you might make that lesson come alive. In, to those particular groups. And then try to anticipate any questions that may brought up, be brought up in the session. Another thing is relating to where your audience is. What are the questions that they might, might be brought up in the mind by the passage of scripture that you need to deal with for them to come to a place of application? So part of this is knowing your audience, knowing those people that are a part of your Sunday school class. Then on Saturday, gather materials you need for your session. Usually that doesn't take too long. You know, if you have some illustrative stuff, make sure that you have your materials ready so they're ready to go out the door. Review your outline with the session progression in mind, hook, book, look, took. Review it again. 
and then pray for your class, which you've been praying for all the way along, but pray especially that the Lord will uh, prepare them as he, as he is preparing you as, as uh, leading that class. And all of those that are, are helping you out with the, or part of the class and are helping you out in that session. Then of course, Sunday morning, briefly review your lesson and pray for God's blessing. And then arrive early. This is one thing, if the Sunday school class leader or teacher comes in at the last minute, don't expect your people to automatically be ready to go. Um, uh, your being there ahead of time and being set up will allow you to greet and prepare and deal with things that will create uh, more harmony in how that session goes and, help, helps, and helps the class focus on what, what the lesson is about. When you come in ill-prepared or late, and I know sometimes that happens and the Lord helps us in spite of the difficulties and the, uh, di the difficulties and things that interrupt our day, um, it, it creates a different dynamic and takes you more time in order to you know, get everybody on the same track. So arrive early, set up the room and greet class members. Uh, mentioned in the other session, is if you're going to use small groups, and I recommend it from time to time, sometimes more frequently with a younger group than you do with the older group, um, have the chair set up that way. Create a little disturbance in their minds when they come in and they're usually in this kind of area and they go, oh, we're having small groups. I said, yeah, but it's going to be fun <laughs> or it's special. Uh, uh, but. Uh, Change the environment a little bit from time to time in order to make the lesson more effective. Don't, don't shy away from doing something that is, that is creative uh, just because you're afraid somebody's not going to take, take it right. I'm going to take a little bit of a break here. I'm going to have somebody else speak, but I want you to watch this video. This video uh, is off of YouTube, uh, and I want you to think of two or three things out of this. What does this video tell you about the learning process if you're a, if, if you're a teacher or a leader? And what does it tell you about how, if you're a teacher of a, of a different audience or a different age group, what does it teach you about that learning process and how does this apply, might apply to your Sunday school class? So what does this teach you about knowledge about teaching people knowledge and understanding, giving them understanding. What does it tell you about the various age groups? And what, it might, what, what might this tell you about how you could apply this information to your own, your own setting? Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? I was on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Justin Sam. First attempt riding the bicycle. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding the bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic procession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. 
I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences, and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. So here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck, but at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically, and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up. You got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he, in how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike vlog. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a Smarter Everyday Meetup, if you will, and I'm going to see if somebody brings a bicycle, and I'm going to try to ride a normal bike. It's backwards, it's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I've proved is that I can only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and I've learned. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. <laughs> I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm back. Oh, click, hold it, hold it, click. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There was a moment. Okay, I can run by. I tried to explain this to the people around me, and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes, and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. That looked like I faked it, didn't it? Yeah. Just a fake. You think I'm faking? You don't believe me. This is so weird. You think I'm lying, don't yeah. you? I'm not lying. I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike, and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things, because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm
Destin, get smarter every day. Have a good So, <laughs> what are your takeaways? What do we learn? No, when he says knowledge and well, what information doesn't equal knowledge. What was, I'm sorry, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, knowledge does not it's equal understanding. Right. Knowledge doesn't equal understanding. Mm -hmm. What does that say to us as, as really Christian educators when it comes to the setting we're in? You know, I think about that last comment. He said, truth is truth, whatever I think. And we certainly hear that in the world. You know, they say, well, you know, it's you tell them something in the Bible. And they say, well, you know, I just don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, you know, I can appreciate that you don't see it that way. But the truth is the truth. And it's not affected by how you see it. Mm -hmm. You're affected by how you see it. But the truth doesn't Ultimately, change. Ultimately, yeah. Very good. Any other Sometimes when on the, at the end of the Sunday school session, when you have, let's say, the best statement that you have prepared, you know, and after you say that and people start, you know, talking about that, you realize that there's a completely different understanding of what you just, mm -hmm. you were thinking of that the whole week, mm -hmm. but at the very end, they got a new thing completely different that you were mm -hmm. expecting. Mm -hmm. you know? Very good. Good. What about the time he talks about the uh, the issue? I mean, he, within his mind, he says, "I know what I need to do. I need to just reverse the process. So cognitively, if I tell myself to do it, mm -hmm. I should be able to do it." But having that knowledge as an engineer didn't mean that he could actually do it. So as a Sunday school teacher. Talking to people who come from various backgrounds and so forth, just telling them the truth doesn't naturally end up in changed lives. It takes what? Outside the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works that way too, but He also works within our limitations. It takes time and experience and repeated time. What did he say about plast about age groups and the effectiveness of learning and how that might imply or affect our Sunday school teaching? Kids are more open than adults. Okay. And are they well sometimes they're more open, sometimes I find they're not. But yeah, yeah. they're more teachable, but they also adapt quicker. And what would that mean about us presenting the gospel and getting them involved? Early age. And we know that from, from a lot of evidence. If kids are more adaptable, more lear learnable, they catch on more quickly. And they don't have, as we, as we know, habit patterns and so forth, many of them that would go against their Christian learning and training. So if you, what you teach a child is in the right way early on and they will not, when they go older, they won't depart from it. There's a lot of truth in that. There is, you know, some kids do. They have free will. But nonetheless, bringing up a kid right and teaching them the gospel and getting them on the right track can have a profound effect on their life trajectory. <coughs> their plasticity, plastic, their plastic, the brain is more plastic, more adaptable than, than, than our, our, our adult brains. And therefore, in teaching them, we may have to teach them on the same principle over and over and over again until they practice and they finally get it. What's the reverse of that? There's a, there's a subtle change, or the ch subtle thing I, I catch at the very end that, that, uh, about um, him unlearning. You know, he, he, he has to unlearn how to ride a bike, and then he has to learn how to back learn how to ride a regular bike it happens more quickly but there is residual information there what about dealing with people who grew up as christians and they have that in their 
their their their DNA, or I'd say their 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 habit patterns. And when they're presented the gospel, I think they much more quickly go back to the faith. They have they show more. I would say they show more. Um, uh, what's the word I want? Maturity early on because they do have that background. Mm -hmm. So when we're dealing with people who grew up in the church, sometimes they catch on much more quickly and we're amazed. Well, quite often you think back, they had Christian parents, they had Christian education and so forth that helps them. So when we know somebody's background, it helps us link, link into that or, or grab that kind of knowledge to help them grow spiritually. Anything else you caught? There's so, there may be some other things that you, you picked up. You know, I was thinking that I talked to the people at the Wycliffe Bible Translators one time, and there were they trained people to go into different parts of the world. And they start out by learning this totally new language, or they even have to create the language. And they said they send people to do that when they're like not more than in their 20s. Because if they're older than that, then you can't learn that new language as well. And I think that's what mm -hmm. he said there, that yep. neuroplasticity. Yes, and you notice people are older and they learn a new language, they still have that old dialect or whatever that makes people, because you've heard people who've come to this country from other places, and they have that real heavy dialect. But if they learn it when they're young, you almost can't tell mm -hmm. that they, you know, that they learned it as a second language and not as their first. Or missionaries going to another place and learning a language as well. Yeah. yeah, that's very, very true. That's very true. What does that do to? Is is there some application about uh, looking at a video and thinking about the principles there, which I think are are solid principles for us to know as is is educators, Christian educators. That's what we are in, in a real sense, and our expectation in how we teach. One thing I noticed was that it took patience and determination to learn. And I think sometimes as teachers, our thought is, oh, I'm going to get to them all in this one lesson. Huh. Like you said, when you go home, it wasn't what you taught in the first place. And I'm going to give it to them because they've got it all. And why should I worry if they come back next week and ask me the same question? Hmm. And mm -hmm. we need to know that sometimes it takes patience and determination. Absolutely, absolutely. Having realistic expectations. What I learned over, over the years in, in that um, we tend as Christian educators, and I really believe that Sunday school teachers and small group leaders need to think of themselves as Christian educators. Um, you know, with a divine, <laughs> with a divine calling. Uh, that quite often we get impatient, more impatient than even God is sometimes, and plow up what I call plowing up our fertile fields. I've seen it with pastors, I've seen it with other teachers. They have great expectations thinking in a short amount of time that they're gonna change things radically and they lose patience with the, with the group or with the people they're dealing with. Sometimes we lose patience with our kids and realize, don't realize that it takes a period of time to go from knowledge, head knowledge, to heart knowledge. And isn't that what we look for with our kids? when they grow through adolescence, you know, from children and so forth, they know the Bible verse, and that's important stuff, and they can recite it. But what, what do we look at, look for, for the real sign of maturity? And sometimes with bated breath. And, what's that? Application. Application and practice. Application and practice. I tell you, I mean, just to be confessional here, is that you know we raised our two boys um, in a Christian home, uh, tried to be very uh, honest about life and God, uh, did our best, and they you know they they did did well, and stayed in church. We we didn't see an awful lot of overt <laughs> rebellion, but you know always a little bit around the edges, 
And as they got out of the home, into the universities and so forth, we, our prayer life ticked up. They were out of our control. And it was only as they got free of the home, free of our direct influence, that we sign, finally, uh, we keep praying for them, but nonetheless saw the fruit of the process. And that was a period of 20, 21 years. And, and being blessed, uh, at least we feel we blessed them with a good Christian home and good training. But we think about all the people in our Sunday school classes and so forth that did not have that advantage, and we get frustrated with them within months. So part of it is having patience that God would have us have with people. To be patient, loving patient, lovingly patient with them as they go forward. And it says in this, in life, patience is a virtue. In ministry, regardless of where you are in ministry, patience is a necessity. And to, to look at people through the eyes of Christ. Uh, we found that when we were doing, when I was involved in, in local church ministry heavily before I went to the headquarters of Global Ministry Center, it took two to three years to establish a new ministry or a new Sunday school class to where it was being productive. That took that long for people to gel and to accept responsibility and it for them to own it. In part because they only lived that life and that, that body connection like once a week, maybe two or three times a week if they had a, a stronger fellowship with one, and one another. And for us, you know, I was, as a minister, I lived it 24 seven, seven days a week. So I expected the change and, and change quickly. They only experienced that body life maybe two, three hours a week. So it taught us to be more patient with the people and patient in Sunday school classes when we were expecting certain things rather than to be very impatient. And it says, I like this passage of scripture out of Galatians. It's not always easy to learn. <laughs> It's easy to learn here, but not easy to learn here. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Galatians, God blesses that. So part of this, our job as Sunday school teachers, as master teachers, and I mean that people who are taking our, our, our calling seriously, is to, to keep the main things alive in our, in, in our hearts and in our communication with those that God has given us responsibility for. One of them that we, you know, we heard about this morning, and you've probably been acquainted with it before, is reframing of what this is called the journey of grace and teaching people that grace is not just the acceptance of Christ into our life once and salvation grace, saving grace, but God is continually working in people's life preveniently, in the people that we're interacting with day by day by day, and start to have eyes of Christ, Christ's eyes about the people we interact with, and to see God working through them and to recognize that. And then to encourage people as they are been saved and are taking more and more responsibility of seeing them commit their lives fully to Christ and, and, and owning that faith in a way that they are being being fruitful. Uh, years ago, we, we brought up a different, a little bit different uh, uh, motif that sort of illustrates the same thing as this journey of grace. And it's based on a more organic model of rooted, fruitful, and growing. Getting people rooted and then fruit and, and growing in the faith and then being fruitful of actually discipling other people, showing fruit. There is that process that is in the Christian life. But we need to keep our, the people that we're educating, including ourselves, to be aware of God's grace working all three of these areas in, in prevenient, saving, and sanctifying grace and looking for it. And how this is activated in any group, and I think especially a Sunday school class or a small group, small group but especially a Sunday school class, is in the prayer life, in our outreach, in our Bible learning. And we talked before about educating people, uh, I mean in the last, I think in the last session, in the 
whole scripture, Old Testament through New Testament, not just focusing on one area, but helping people understand the full life and, and, and uh, uh, message of God that he's, that he's given us through, through scripture. And then intentional mentoring and equipping people and having an authentic relationship to where people know us. And they see, see us when we are just finite humans. <laughs> but they also understand our heart. One thing that impressed me when I was growing up, and I grew up in a pastor's home, and it was not my, I'll, I'll just be confessional, it was not my desire to be a minister. I wanted to be an engineer or a chemist or a pilot and other things, and my aptitude was in, in chemistry and so forth, and uh, uh, God had to tug on me several, several times to get me to, to change uh, change directions. I always knew that was what he was calling me to and I would say, Lord, you know, let me be this first and then I'll be that for you. Um, but I remember one, one case uh, when I was going, my, going to my freshman year at NNU, I had signed up to, uh, uh, in chemistry and science and I went over to the table where they had the science table with, with everyone there, and they said, we don't have your name here, Larry. I think they have them over in the religion department. I hadn't communicated that, and I know <laughs> my family hadn't communicated. So there were just things like that that nudged me in that direction uh, that was a, a clear indicator of, of, of where I should go, and God was patient with me to move, move me in that direction. But through that, uh, my struggle, my, my struggle wasn't with the theology, and my struggle wasn't with the calling except for my, avail, my ability to be what I felt he wanted me to be. I was, I was thinking I'd rather be something else than be a minister because I saw my dad struggle in other words. Not, not in his struggles morally or anything else, but I knew what it cost to be a minister sometimes and a pastor of of, of, a, of a church, especially the, the work that he did. He took a lot of congregations that were struggling and he would go in there and they'd gone through difficulty and then bring them up, uh, get them solid, and then they would hand it off to another, to another pastor and he'd pick, pick another struggling, struggling church and did some tremendous work. I just, <laughs> that, did, that didn't, wasn't the, the trajectory I wanted in my life. But one thing I couldn't get away from, and this is the point of what I'm trying to share with you, is the life of my parents. They weren't perfect, certainly I wasn't, but the integrity of their life was always true to God through the weaknesses and the strengths and so forth. I could not die, deny their impact on my life and their life trajectory. And uh, from that point, uh, uh, I just had, <laughs> I didn't have to, that sounds like God forced me to, but because of the strength of their character and the strength of, of their trajectory in life and their honesty uh, and their authentic living of the faith, um, I, I, I had to embrace, embrace God like I'd never had before and God has been so, so much more faithful than I, than I ever, ever could have expected for him to be and blessed. And people are looking for that. People that are honest about life and honest about uh, their struggles, but always consistent in their bias towards God. Regardless of what comes my way, I'm being faithful to him. That is that part of the curriculum that you don't read out of a quarterly, but you see in the life of a leader. And that's what the world needs to see in, in master teachers and leaders. And God provides the strength to make that happen. So. If in your group you work on these things and promote them within the group um, and make them aware that these elements, fervent prayer, being outreach, being conscious of God's prevenient grace, saving grace, and sanctifying grace, you will see God move within that group and consistently and systematically move people uh, closer to him and, and be effective as Christians. I have one, I'm going to share some resources, and I know we're coming close to time and I don't want to infringe on anybody else. Um, 
I did want to share a couple things with you just very, very quickly. Uh, simplify what would be 10 minutes into five, I guess, or four or three. Uh, I don't know if you've ever come across this. I know I shared this with you. Here is our copies of NDI's Total Ministry brochure. We call it the Total Ministry. It's actually just uh, the annual ministry brochure. And inside there are connections to resources. You can use your QR, QR code, code and other things to get to them. Everything from videos and so forth to uh, we have other copies here that will help you in your ministry within the local church. Especially in the resources section uh, under Nazarene.org, we are putting more and more videos, more and more resources that are available to, to help strengthen Christian lives outside of the Sunday school class. So it augments what's happening in, in a Sunday school class. And if you're not aware of it already, Dr. Gray or Dr. Rainey provides the Sunday school lesson on YouTube a week before you have to teach it. So is he actually teaching it on YouTube? So you can watch somebody else. You can watch it. Now it is, you know, it's a simplified version, but it is the lesson. It is one of the, the resources is provided free to everybody. He does it sacrificially. <laughs> it's either him or it will be uh, uh, our uh, past global, global editor, Frank Moore, will teach it as well. So make sure your people know that and yourself, you know, on a, in, in 15 or 20 minutes, you get the full version of, of what's gonna be taught the following week, especially if you're using, uh, you know, Nazarene uh, Foundry curriculum. So make use, make use of that. Hey, how do we find that on your YouTube? YouTube, uh, you can look up either Scott Rainey or you can go uh, Foundry Adult Curriculum. Or you can look on, on Nazarene.org. But I think I think Joe is planning on making all of these presentations. Today yes, he is. On yeah. And I'll have give him a copy of this this PowerPoint as well, so it'll it'll be there as well. But um, we're finding more and more people are discovering that he's been doing that for the last couple of years, and slowly people are realizing that it's that it's there and it's a great help to them. Then we have the Journey newsletter, e-newsletter, that just came out fresh in this new version as of, I think, January. And every, it's, it's every other month we, we put it out and it has resources and links to it, uh, materials associated with discipleship and NDI ministry. And if you haven't signed up for it, you have to buy subscription. We're not gonna send you junk mail. Um, there's new laws about you know, how you process email addresses and so forth, but you can go to it and there is a link on the brochure you just received that will connect you to the Journey newsletter and you can sign up. And anybody is welcome to sign up for that. And um, here are the resources that we recommend right off the top which you will find in this brochure is the Foundry resources. They have curriculum at every age and you saw that if you're down. Yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up here in just one minute. Foundry, then Discipleship Place, Wesleyan Holiness Discipleship li Library. If you're doing something in another language, we're trying to provide curriculum and materials in other languages as well so we get more people. And then there is VBS curriculum that can be used for children at every age and sometimes it's used for midweek services and other things and it's done in both English and Spanish and um, some excellent resources there so 